سبيل الدموع سبيل مريح تنا أدا يا صاحي كي تستريح وبث الدعاء الخفي الصريح السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to evolution devolution or devolution which is our two part series exploring the concept of evolution and how does that fit in or does it fit in at all with islamic understanding and islamic principles first a little bit about the title obviously evolution speaks for itself we know what that means well we will hopefully know what that means through the uh, length of today's uh, discussion devolution well devolution uh, if we looked at the uh, textbook definition of devolution then devolution is the transfer or delegation of power to a lower level so what i'm talking about devolution here is the devolution of power away from god away from allah into the hands of humans so that's the devolution part but then a little more play with words and we get to devolution that what's the actual motivation what's the who's who's kind of behind it all and really this is satanic understanding of how this world has come about and then there's a little bit of dilution in there if you can take out the evil part and you're left with the d i saw so much play words going on here it's remarkable you know there you go you've got evil there and then you've got dilution as well so hopefully that's uh, enough thought about the actual title itself and what's the title about but it just sets the scene a little bit and gives you a somewhat understanding of what it is we're going to discuss again the usual information but the key point really is the telegram channel if you want to have access to other material uh, about how we can you know live our contemporary lives with an understanding and linking to islam then that's where you need to be a uh, a member of and you can just join that for, uh, without any as long as you've got the telegram app but also obviously we've got our youtube channel as well which is most likely where you've received this video we're going to go on to sorry we had a few button problems there we're going to go on to part one okay and part one is bob might be your uncle but who's your real ancestor so that's what part one is yes as you've seen from my atheism um uh, titles i do like provocative titles a little bit of humor in there and it's just to uh, uh sort of set the scene so there we have it bob might be your uncle but who's your real uncle from there now first of all we need a backdrop to before we discuss evolution in trying to understand why the evolution theory itself um, first of all it already came about in the 19th century in, in in its in its sort of detailed form yes there is some discussion that previously there were some points made by certain individuals with respect to um, the concept of evolution but in reality the evolution as we understand it uh, was in the 19th century and really we were thought by the 20th century with the development of science it should have been dismissed so why wasn't it dismissed well if you have watched the two-part atheism atheism series and if you haven't i would suggest you watch those first we will understand that there is a, a ploy there is a, a desire there is an aim and a plan in place in replacing god replacing allah and this is coming particularly from the new atheists so so just extra click there um man and his purpose so first of all as as muslims and as believers we know that man was created and when man was created he was created with a purpose and that purpose was obviously to serve allah and he had certain roles to play for example he's considered as the vice regent of allah on the surface of the earth which means he's also responsible for looking after the, the the earth itself for looking after the seas for looking after the land for looking after animals and for ensuring there's justice and fairness and equality on the land so he has a, a higher purpose a higher goal also that purpose a purpose that he has is that this world itself is is short and he's actually preparing for the hereafter and it's the hereafter that's his real aim and in order to achieve that he must do certain things and he must avoid certain things so it's important that we understand that now some people don't accept this purpose some people feel that there is no god and if there is no god then he has no purpose but then they need something to justify that understanding um oops i've been clicking backwards Oh, yes, uh, I'm all over the place at the moment. 
So man and his purpose. Secondly, there had to be an alternative to the theistic narrative. The theistic narrative speaks of uh, Allah, God creating uh, Adam and Hawa, Adam and Eve, and from there coming the children, the, the the many children which were born, and then from then on, and then you know we have that as a, as our theistic understanding. And from there, obviously, we, there is a set purpose, a goal for man, there is a goal for humans, and they have to achieve those goals. And there needed to be, uh, especially for the atheists, an alternative narrative, because they couldn't, obviously, by being atheists, not accept the theistic narrative. Now, we've seen from the atheism series that the aim was that science is the new god. But if you have watched the atheism series, you'll see that's not necessarily true. And as a result, that's why I've put the question mark there. If you haven't seen that, I would suggest you go see that first. The reason being is there's a lot of material in there which will then tie into the material that we're going to discuss uh, today. And it was the only alternative theory available. Nobody else had come up with a structured theory discussing how humans or how anything made its way on this earth. And not only that, even going beyond that, is how did this earth come about in the first place? And how did the universe come about? And so there were no, there was no alternative theory. But if we're just talking about the creatures and the living creatures on this earth and not go beyond that, then there was no alternative theory available. So no matter how strange the theory was no matter how it didn't fit with the science both empirical and rational it had to be accepted and if it had to be bent crushed changed modified then so be it because it was the only theory available for the atheist in order to have a narrative with respect to arriving on this earth and importantly to replace allah to replace god so in order to understand evolution, I did mention to you, we need to understand the 19th century in particular. And the individual is Charles Darwin. And I have been intentional by calling it Darwinism because it is an ism. Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882. He was a naturalist, an English naturalist, but he's also an amateur geologist and biologist. And what he did was he spent some time in the Galapagos Islands. And in the Galapagos Islands, he noticed the various types of finches that were there. And what he noticed in these finches was a different form of beak. And from this, he deduced, that, or rather he induced, from this he induced, that there must have been a common ancestor. Because this finch must have arrived, or, or a type of finch, or a couple of finches, or a group of finches, or a flock of finches, whichever way you want to describe them, had made their way to the Galapagos Islands. And then what they had done is they'd separated out on the islands so that they were no longer mixing with each other. And what was going on is they were adapting. So even though the, orig the original arrival of finches, they were all the same, because they took up residency in different parts of the uh, islands, then and they stopped engaging with one another, then because of the types of foods which were available, whether it was honey, whether it was um, seeds, whether it was insects, whatever type of food that was available, you notice the beak changing. So this was his argument that we start off with a common ancestor and then by means of natural selection, we see the animal changing. Okay, by, the animal changes. It's adapting to its surroundings. That was his theory. Now, he did not see, he did not observe any of this. This was based on his reasoning. So it was a rational method, method he employed. He did, not, he did not employ an empirical method. All he saw were different type of finches. And he made this, assum he made this assumption that there, there was originally these finches, uh, 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 one type of finch had arrived. And from that one type of finch, all these other finches developed. He did, however, he's dedicated a chapter called Difficulties of the Theory in his book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, in which he highlights three points which he says, you know, we need to be able to answer this. The first thing is the fossil record in the, uh, in the 19th century did not actually substantiate his claims. Secondly, he still couldn't answer the question of how complex organs of living things came about. And thirdly, he could not understand the instincts of living beings, how they were handed over, because there was nothing that, that could be measured in terms of determining an instinct. So yes, you can measure eyes, you know, the speed uh, and, and color and, and things of that nature from the DNA. Obviously, Charles Darwin wasn't aware of DNA and that became a problem for him. In the early, or the, the Darwinism theory had a problem within the early 20th century because of that. So his view was that 
um, how do animals develop instincts and then how do they pass those instincts on to their young, to the offspring. As we moved into the 20th century, then Darwinism itself was not answering all the questions or rather Darwinism now with the development of science was found problematic in areas. So there needed to be a way, law of genetics in particular caused problems in the earlier 20th century. And this required now the neo-Darwinists of which we see the new atheists are hand in hand, if not the exact same individuals, needed to, needed to resolve these problems. So one of the things that was discussed in more detail was random mutations that were taking place within the DNA. So at least they could use the DNA in, in, in their defense as well, that look, these mutations are taking place in the DNA. And when these mutations take place in the in DNA, then we get advantageous mutation. Now, we, I put a question mark next to that, because that's another area that we're going to explore. Do we get advantageous mutations? The problem was, as Charles Darwin had found in his difficulties of the theory chapter, is that the fossil record wasn't substantiating their position. It was the basically the science wasn't supporting the theory. They could find no transitional forms whatsoever. There was no creature that was part way through. So the way it was explained is that, look, this is something called punctuated equilibrium. In other words, animals made a jump. So basically what we're saying here is that animals stayed exactly the same as they were with very, very minor modifications over a huge period of time. And then over a relatively short period of time, the creature would change so much that it would become a new species. In other words, if we were to say, if we were to take that evidence and speak it without tainting it, uh, with with our view that God does not exist, what we're basically saying is that all the creature, the creature as it was, stayed the same, and it stayed. This species existed for a long time, and then a new species arrived. That's what we're really saying. But that would suggest creation, and that would suggest a God, and that would obviously go against the theory. Why? Because the theory has to work. For new atheists, the theory of neo-Darwinism has to work because the alternative is believing in creation and believing in a God. And so it's a really a belief system we have, not science. It's this a priori philosophical position that they adopt where they approach with this view that there has to be, uh, this theory has to work and there cannot be a God. There cannot be creation. So this is something which has already been accepted. This is something which they already want. So they will look into the science or they will look into whatever is found empirically and read that into the empirical work. So we need to bear that in mind. So before we move too further on, what is the theory based on? We've already mentioned common ancestor which is uh, or common descent which is what um, Charles Darwin suggested when he saw these various types of finches in the Galapagos Islands he was suggesting that there all these various type of finches with different beak sizes had come from a finch or a bird-like finch that existed thousands maybe maybe millions of years whenever or hundreds of thousands of years most likely before the bird had arrived and because the birds are now been located in separate areas on the island had actually uh, adapted to the food sources and changed so this is the common descent so we have a common ancestor example the both the buffalo and the buzzard have a common ancestor but in reality if you were to keep going back and then every creature would only have one ancestor and from that one ancestor there would be changes for the various creatures to come about but these are only referring to similarities. It's only highlighting similarities in creatures and making an assumption that because these creatures are similar, like he saw, like Charles Darwin saw, he saw that these finches looked similar. So because he looked similar, he assumed from that that they must have a common ancestor. But the question still arises, how did the ancestor get there? That doesn't answer that question. All he's answered is the original flock of finches arriving or finch-like birds arriving. And then those finch-like birds, not really changing much, so that's why I'm referring to them as finches, not changing much, but only their beaks changing. So there's still similarities there, but then how did the ancestor get there? How, you know, where did, where did the ancestor come from? And why do these descendants differ? You know, why did they change? Now, I've already alluded to the fact uh, 
that this is based upon the view that these in, these birds were now living in different areas and they were adapting. So we'll discuss that in, in detail. Here's, here's another point as well with an example. For instance, rabbits and bears have fur. So ans this ancestor must also have had fur. But then how did the ancestor get there in the first place? And why did they differ? Why did bears, you know, become creatures like the way they are? And why did rabbits turn out to be like the way they are? Rabbits, very placid, very, you know, uh, um, herbivores, don't really cause any scene, stay out of the way. Bears, very different, can be very aggressive, uh, claws, uh, you know, eat fish most regularly, but they are carnivores. So why did they develop differently? And how did this happen? Well, for that, um, Charles Darwin needed two other things in order to take this theory forward from the concept of a common ancestor. And what he did was something called natural selection. Again, if you notice the word natural selection is clearly suggesting, like we have natural disaster, that there is no it being involved there is no god involved there's you know it's not a divine disaster it's not a divine selection it's natural selection so the language itself is clearly suggesting that there is no involvement of god and the way he tried to explain this was that fitter animals produce more surviving offspring that that's the view he adopted because when you have fitter animals then they will obviously live longer um, because if they're stronger, they will survive. If they're faster, they won't get eaten. And as a result, when they survive, they will be having young, more young, because the non-fitter ones, the slower ones, will might have, you know, uh, offspring for two years in a row, and then the third year they get eaten. Or because they're not strong, they can't defend them, they can't attack animals and catch animals to eat, they die. Whereas the fitter ones are producing young every year. So eventually the percentage or the ratio of fitter and non-fitter will continue to increase until eventually the non-fitter have been replaced completely by the fitter. So if the total population remains the same, then the fitter, which could be faster, stronger, whatever, will do better in nature than the less fit, which is what I've just explained. Then the question comes up is why do some become fitter than the others if they're in the same environment? If they're all sharing the same environment, let's say there's a uh, a a load of wildebeest, okay, and um, and for some some of them are fitter and others aren't fitter. What is it that's making them fitter than the others? You know, if they've all been raised in the same place in the same area, why are they becoming fitter than the rest? Well there is something that there's put forward to support that, which is something called random mutation. Again, language is important. Random, meaning nothing is directing it. And so you can clearly tell, as a scientist, you wouldn't add terms to, uh, or adjectives to words. You would have just said mutation. And earlier, when we saw the title, it would have been selection. Now you're seeing a change now, because now, uh, people are becoming a bit more savvy and people are becoming a little bit more aware that by putting certain words in front, um, you know, people are going to pick up on this. So now it's been dropped and it's just called selection. But originally it was random mutation. Now it's called variation. So this is a chance mutation. Basically, what it means is obviously, again, Charles Darwin wasn't aware of evolution, but uh, sorry, he wasn't aware of what well, he might not have been aware. He wasn't aware of the DNA and the genetic structure. But now with science, we a mutation is when somewhere within the DNA there, there's a problem. We will get to that in this time. So he mentions here that a chance mutation takes place, and this chance mutation is something which makes the creature fitter, stronger, faster, whatever it is. It's a positive mutation, yet even though the word mutation seems to suggest that it won't be, whenever we hear the word mutant or mutation, it's a negative impact it has because that's what we expect. But it's a positive mutation, and not only is it positive, it's progressively positive. It's progressively mutating because we find that a creature to reach the final point and the starting point, it has to go through regular mutations. For instance, the argument is given that there was a a, a, a common ancestor which was like a donkey type creature and then obviously it started to you know a one creature then there was um, a mutation in its uh, DNA which produced it with a slightly longer neck so what happened was this slightly longer neck creature could get to the higher trees 
and as a result, when food was scarce at the lower area, it was no problem for the slightly longer necked creature because it could reach the higher, and therefore the shorter necked creature died out, and the longer necked creature survived, and eventually it became the only creature that existed, and then it was the only one that had young, suggesting again that the mutation was passed on. But we also know that those creatures that had shorter necks also survived. So, but anyway, we're gonna we're getting ahead of ourselves. So for now, positive progressive mutation. This positive progressive mutation makes it faster and stronger. And then natural selection means, which we've already talked about, its offspring are more numerous because obviously being fitter, it's going to live longer. Living longer means it's going to have more offspring. More offspring means that the ratio, if the population stays the same, will start to incline, lean towards the fitter creature, the stronger creature. So eventually it will become more numerous than the non-mutated, slower, weaker version until eventually with the passage of time, because this passage of time is key, all the weaker, slower version will disappear and you're only left with the stronger, you know, the survival of the fittest. You're only left with the stronger ver version. So let's analyze natural selection now. So we've got a zebra herd, okay? And these, are, these zebra are attacked by wild animals. So these obviously herd just moves around and it will be attacked by wild animals. So when we get the fastest zebra, we know that the fastest zebra aren't going to get caught. Okay, it's either the ones who are ill, the either the ones who are slow, either the ones who, who you know can't get away or whatever, slightly overweight, whatever you want to say. So the slow ones will get eaten, okay, and the strong ones will survive. And what we find is then that because the stronger ones are getting, you know, the number of the weaker ones is reducing, then obviously their offspring is also reducing. Whereas the uh, the fitter ones are percentage-wise increasing, even if the actual number is not increasing. So the young will start to increase. But does that zebra change into another species? No, it doesn't. The zebra will be a zebra. For example, um, if, uh, you know, let's take it from on a human perspective. If humans were being chased by uh, wild creatures, then all the wild creature will do is pick off the slower humans and eat them and consume them. For whatever reason, they're slow. Maybe they're not very fit. Maybe they're not very active. Maybe uh, they don't have a strong body structure. So they will die and the strong will survive. So when the strong have children, then the children will, one assumes, the DNA will pass to them and they will also be strong. But does that mean that the human changes? Well, that doesn't make sense. It clearly doesn't. So, you know, we can see how that natural selection is not absolutely perfect. But what about random mutations? Well, let's look at random mutations. And I, I already kind of introduced mutations. Uh, random mutations is the breaking or the replacement in the DNA molecule. And this is caused by radiation or chemical reactions. So it's actually breaking or replacing something. So it's not, not, it's not a good thing. Okay, this is actually... Uh, breaking, uh, changing something chemically, uh, and it's this impact which um, ha will will obviously cause a problem to the creature. Mutations, in the most case, are neutral because the mutation is so small that it has little to no effect on the creature, on the whatever it may be, the species. Generally speaking, mutations are harmful. But it is argued, and it has to be proven, that mutations have to, are beneficial in order for the evolution theory to be valid. Because if evolution, if the mutations are not beneficial, then the for the uh, then the evolution theory can't hold. Okay, so let's explore that. Mutations are helpful, and we have a long list here of those mutations which have been described as helpful. And it's argued here that all these mutations are helpful. But if you just have a glance down there, these are the only ones, you know, that I could find, really, and that I could locate. Now, if you look at it, you're seeing certain keywords there, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, bacteria that eat nylon, sickle cell resistance to malaria, lactose tolerance, resistance to ather atherosclerosis immunity to HIV, locus tolerance to pesticides, 
So what you're seeing here is a tolerance that's taking place here. So whether it's the antibiotic, some bacteria which becomes resistance to anti resistant to antibiotic, or whether it's uh, any the sickle cells which are produced through a mutation which becomes resistance to malaria, then the answer is quite simple here, that this is just a case of resistance and tolerance, not mutation, okay? Bacteria immune to antibiotics, for example, is that subpopulation which is not affected. So what we're saying here, and this is be the main thrust of our thesis, is that you have a natural distribution of bacteria. And what happens is um, certain population of the bacteria is not resistant to antibiotics, but some is. Okay, some is. And it is that part which is all that's becoming is that's becoming apparent. That's all. So when we see, for example, uh, locust tolerance to pesticides, then these locusts that were landing on plants and eating these pesticides, those who didn't have a tolerance to it died out. Those who did have a tolerance to it survived. And as a result, when they survived, they were the only ones give, bearing young offspring. And obviously they passed it on. So that's not like the creature changed. Okay, There was already within the population of the locusts, those that were tolerant. It wasn't as if the locusts were eating this pesticide and dying and then one chance mutation in a pesticide meant that when he ate it, he didn't die. And as a result, when he had young, then it was all right. Because that chance mutation would not only have to take place in one locust, it would have to take place in a large number of locusts in order eventually for the locusts as a total community to be tolerant to pesticides, which makes no sense whatsoever. So you will see the argument that I'm making throughout this thesis that all we're talking about here is a distribution, a variance which exists within the main population of the locus, where we have a significant large number of them, maybe three quarters of them originally when pesticides first came on the scene, maybe even 80%. So when pesticides were first invented and first placed onto plants, maybe, and these are just numbers I'm plucking out the air. I'm not saying that I've actually done any research on this. So 80% were not tolerant to the pesticides, 20% were. So what happens? That out of the 80%, maybe 50% died. Well, now you're seeing that the only ones which are, the ones which are surviving now, that percentage has increased. It's not as if there's been a mutation. These creatures already had the resistance to uh, pesticides, like humans. Some of us have resistance to things as we're born like that. We're just we just we don't, you know. There's some of us who catch flus just for a laugh. And there's some of us who can go 5, 10, 15 years without catching a flu. What's that? Is that meaning that this person mutated or something? It's because this person, he was born like that. He's got a tolerance. Does this mean that this person has changed, become a different species? Of course not. He's still a human. Okay. So this is what's being confused when we're looking at random mutations. So mutations, when we're generally seeing, they are harmful. Let's look at Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Chernobyl. In all cases, they are harmful. It's we're reaching now the world of comic books to start to think that a mutation is anything positive, like X-Men or Teenage, uh, was it Mutant Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or whatever it is. You know, to think that a mutation will make some, you know, like Superman or something, that like that he was, you know, or Spider-Man. Spider-Man got bitten by a spider and as a result, he mutated. So he became a better man, uh, a stronger man. You know, these are all comic book sort of thinking which exists. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with reality because when we see those people that were afflicted, aff afflicted by the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs and when what happened in the 80s in Chernobyl, we didn't see anybody suddenly developing uh, X-ray eyes. We didn't see anybody developing you know, sort of unhuman, uh, inhuman strength. We didn't see anybody developing a different be a human becoming a superhuman. It never happened. In fact, in all of those cases, we saw children being born with with limbs half made, half full, you know, half limbs, if that's the right word for it, uh, other deficiencies. And we saw that mutations are harmful. In fact, fruit flies, which is a, a common creature to use in experimentation, A, because they're, uh, they produce lots of young and also their span. 
of, uh, of living is very short. So you can go through many generations very, very quickly. Now, thousands of experiments have been carried out across the world in laboratories to try to see if the fruit fly through a random mutation can A, become a different creature, and if not become a different creature, become a better fruit fly. No new species or enzyme has been produced at all. So in the laboratory, we cannot observe this. So again, I'm talking science here. I'm not talking, you have not seen me quote a single verse of the Quran here yet. You're not seeing me quote anything else. All I'm talking about is science here. So after thousands of experiments, no new species or enzyme. What happens is the mutants die. They are sterile. They don't actually bear you. They can't bear you. And all they revert back to the original type if they are capable of offspring. Mutations don't add no new information to an organism's DNA. As we've said before, it actually destroys partially the DNA. Now, sometimes the rest of the species' the DNA can compensate for that, and that has a minor effect or a minimal effect. But in some cases, it can't. And we can only list half a dozen things so far in which mutation supposedly has had a beneficial effect. And I've already explained to you that that's not down to mutation having a beneficial effect. That's just resistance and tolerance because they were already within the population. Uh, because you get a variety within the population, those which already had that tolerance. And for a mutation to be passed on to the next generation, it has to take place in the reproductive cells. Otherwise, it will not pass on. So again, the distribution has to take place within the, oh, sorry, the distribution is something which is taking place within the main population. Now, here's an interesting point, And this is a point which is uh, argued uh, about the, again, the, uh, what's, uh, the adaption uh, or the adaptive nature or the speciation uh, but mainly adaptive nature of creatures. We saw, for example, uh, in the 80s, uh, the biology of evolution, in which around the Industrial Revolution time, uh, the trees around Manchester and the north were a light colour. And so what would happen is that when the moths would sit on it, those which were a light colour were fine. But they were the black ones would stick out like a sore thumb. So when the birds were flying around, they would notice them and they would eat them. So what would happen is that the light colored moths were a huge number and the black colored moths dropped. But with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, we saw then that the trees were no longer a light color because of the smog going up out in the air, because of the excuse me, the smoke going out in the air, uh, the trees started to become dark. Well, now this benefited the dark moths because when they would sit on the bark, you couldn't see them, but you could actually see the white moths. So the white moths got picked out. So what the evolutions, evolutionists said is that the light colored moths have evolved because when they went around to measure to see how many white colored moths were left and how many black, they said, ah, that proves that the white colored moths, because we can't find them anymore, they have evolved into black moths. Nonsense. Absolute rubbish. Science? No. Because what was going on here was that basically the white moths had all been eaten. That's why. It's not because the white moths turn into black moths. It's because the white moths got eaten and only the black moths were left. So therefore, it's just a, dis a change in ratio, a distribution shift, because the population has a mixture of black and white moths. So when it's a time where white moths can be eaten easier, then only black moths are seen. So people will think, oh, the black, the white moths have turned into black moths. And when it's a time where the black moths are getting eaten, then everybody will think, oh, what happened here? There was a mutation which took place and that benefit benefited the moths because those moths which went black weren't seen and those moths which remained white were seen. It was not a mutation. It was just the standard distribution amongst the population in that there were black moths and that there were white moths. And this is referred to as an industrial melanism, which was pushed by many evolutionists to talk about uh, this speciation which has taken place. But even if we accept this point, which is not, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to accept it, but let's just pretend to accept it for a second, that the moth did not change into another creature. It would be far better for the moth to change into a huge bird and eat the bird that's trying to eat it. That would be a better mutation, but that didn't happen. 
So again, it's this confusion about what's actually taking place. So let's draw it, all this to a conclusion. This is tolerance. We can build up tolerance within the confines of staying exactly as we are. We can become more tolerant of something. We know, for example, just on diets as humans, you know, we can become, some of us are more tolerant to some things than others. Uh, and therefore we can build up that tolerance. This is nothing more than a normal distribution amongst the population. So if when we go back to uh, Charles Darwin, when he saw all these birds with different beaks, then this, uh, these were all different species or rather subspecies of the bird. That's all they were. There were subspecies of the bird. It did not mean, so how do we answer that? You know, how can we say that? Well, hold on, if he saw different birds, you know, he saw certain bird, uh, beak sized birds in a certain area of the Galapagos Islands, and he saw a certain uh, bird in another type and a certain bird in another type. Where had the other birds gone? Where was this normal distribution that you talk about? Well, if the bird's beak is designed in such a way in that it can't reach the food, then it will die. Like the way the white moths, when they were sat on a black bark that could be seen from, from you know, from a mile away, then they're going to get eaten. And therefore, only the black moths are going to survive. So in the same way, those birds that are going to have a beak, which is, say, for example, let's just say the food that's only available here is, um, um, I don't know, seeds. So for seeds, you need a small beak. OK. And originally, the distribution was here that you had birds of all beak sizes. But because obviously the food started to become scarce, as in, and then, but yet there was only, and there was a surplus of seeds, but all the other type of food became scarce. Now either the birds have to disappear from here, or they will die, or there will be such small numbers which won't be noticed because the food level. So that's all this is. It's not, you know, we're, we're taking something so simple and so basic, which was the observation that Charles Darwin did, and we've concocted such a complicated theory in order to justify what? In order to justify the replacing of Allah. So let's turn to the fossil record now, because this was a little bit of a problem that came up for um, Charles Darwin himself. And this is what he said. He said, if my theory be true, numberless, yeah, numberless intermediate varieties linking most closely all of the species of the same group together must assuredly have existed. That's what he said. Why? If species have descended from other species by fine gradations, meaning slight changes, which are all due to mutations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? The answer is no, we don't. No transitional forms have been discovered to date. In all the fossils that are being dug up, in all the fossils everywhere that have been dug up on this planet, over the centuries that they've been dug up, not a single person, there's been many frauds, but not a single person has been able to find a transitional form. Yet listen to what Charles Darwin said. If my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties. Well, there aren't any. So what does that mean about his theory? This theory cannot be true. So if this theory has been proven empirically not to be true, why are people still holding on to it? Fossil record number two. Derek Egar says, there's not gradual evolution, but the sudden explosion of one group at the expense of another. What he's saying is you do not see these little gradations where you see these beautiful pictures of an ape-like creature and then slowly standing up, then standing up a little bit more, standing up a little bit more, losing hair, standing up a little bit more, standing, until you get this chap standing up, right? And he said, there you go, nice. Or you see a little horse with, uh, with you know, with four toes and then a slightly bigger horse with two, three toes and then a slightly bigger horse with two toes and then a slightly bigger horse with one toe and then you get a horse and you see this nice linear graph. Nonsense. This is all made up. This is all science fiction like the X-Men and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is all science fiction. Because Derek mentions, if I can call him that, that this is not gradual evolution, but the sudden explosion of one group at the expense of another, which sounds very much like creation. Mark, and I'm not even going to care to mention his surname, but I think it's pronounced Zanecki. He says, this record has never revealed traces of Darwin's hypothetical intermediate variants. Instead, species appear and disappear abruptly. And finally, the fossil record nevertheless continues to be composed mainly of gaps, particularly at what point? Particularly when you're looking at these intermediate variants 
or when you're looking for gradual evolution doesn't exist now to prove further that this doesn't exist i'm going to use two examples one is a slightly slight generic example and one is a very specific example an argument that's given is that animals move from water to land that's what animals did animals originally started in water and made their way out to land okay well let's explore this theory of water to land that these creatures originally started in water and then they made their way onto land and to see how much water sorry you couldn't help it how much water this theory holds okay so here we go first of all for a creature to move from water to land then it has to consider its weight now when you're in a, in the sea you're not you don't have to carry much of your weight because you allow the water to do so but when you're going to go out onto land obviously now you've got to be concerned about your weight and it's said that around 50 percent of the consumption of food that animals take on board land uh, animals take on board is due to carrying around their own bodies and that's not the concern of a, of a creature coming out of the water so that would require muscular and skeletal mutations not just one muscle and i'm not even going to tell you how many muscles there are in a creature not just one uh, part of the bone structure we're talking about complete change in bone structure all these mutations would have to take place but that's not it another mutation would have to take place the other mutation that would have to take place is that creatures which are in the water breathe through gills generally speaking they don't have no need for a lung those of us that are outside land dwelling we have lungs so that would also have to take place and all those things associated with it because we don't breathe through our gills to reach our lungs we breathe through our mouths so that would have to change as well the water itself well a fish or a creature living in the sea doesn't need to be too concerned about moisture because it's, it's in water all the time but a creature which is now out in the land of course it does its skin would have to mutate why because the skin would have to change from being a skin which is constantly in touch with water to now being a skin which is not in touch with water at all whereas in the water it would be able to keep itself cool and it would be able to internalize that cooling meaning it didn't need external cooling outside it would have to need external cooling meaning its body would have to make sweat in order to keep it cool its body would have to make moisture in order to keep it the skin supple and alive and obviously there would be a concept of thirst a creature living inside water would have no need for water uh, it would be taking it in through its gills but a creature living out would have to drink so again we're talking massive changes both with inside the creature and outside the creature in order for it to survive on land body temperature when the uh, a creature is in the water its body temperature is very much easily controlled because it stays in one part of the water so either that's at the surface slightly lower down or right down in the depths whereas a creature which is out in the uh, on land it has to consider the variance of heat so it can go sometimes you know in winter to minus you know degrees celsius and in summer it can reach as high as 25 30 degrees celsius and even during the day itself it can change so this huge variance in temperature it would also need to take into consideration one to manage that and also having the appropriate skin to be able to deal with that and you know i'm keeping these brief because i didn't want this lecture to go too much beyond 45 minutes and i'm aware i'm already pushing on 45 minutes and i know i have a number of slides left food well this would be a whole new ball game because it would need something to chew food with it would then need somehow to swallow that food it would then be digested in a different way being a land creature and being a sea creature there's a huge difference of uh, in terms of food consumption and digestion eyes you don't need eyelids when you're inside the water but you do need eyelids when you're outside the water uh, because your eyes will dry out if you keep your eyes constantly open whereas when you're in water that's not a problem that's not a concern so there's a case of eyelids movement when you're in water your movement can be just let yourself be and you'll just float around in the water or the currents can move you around that's not going to happen if you get onto land and you just sit there hoping to move you're going to need legs and muscles and in certain cases especially if you're small you're going to be somebody's dinner so you've got to move quick time okay movement is another issue and this would mean a whole new system of moving the body in such a way that it would maintain its uh, its balance and at the same time be able to pick up speed and at the same time be able not to cause injury to oneself 
Kidneys, kidneys, another one. Uh, see the creatures in the sea; they can easily discharge waste materials. Okay, especially the buildup of ammonia uh, from their filtering system, because there's plenty of water in their habitat. But land creatures, they're stuck because they've got to use water more economically. They can't just be using water left, right, and center. So what they have to do is they will have to change the ammonia into urea, which happens in the kidneys. So there's going to be a need for kidneys. Now I've not listed everything. But these things have to take place. But you know what's even worse is all these things have to take place at the same time. Because if you have a creature who every single muscle, listen to how ridiculous it sounds. Every single muscle is going through a mutation and every single bone is going through a mutation. It will also, and it made it out into the world, out onto the land. Guess what? It didn't, his breathing hasn't been sorted. The water hasn't been sorted. They're dealing with the water issues, the body temperature, the food. So it's going to die. Or if a creature sorted its eyelids out, made its way out, it doesn't, that's not happened, so it will die. So every single creature who only has one of these mutations will die. It will not live long enough to breed and have offspring. It will die. For a creature, for all of these to happen at the same time, well, I'm not even going to explain the maths of how highly, highly, highly improbable that is. Because I do want to keep these lectures accessible uh, to, to, to the average person. And if I go too much into the science, if I go too much into the maths, uh, some people are going to just sort of switch off, assuming they haven't switched off already. Let's carry on. They all have to be progressive as well, meaning that if it's a chance mutation, then there's a 50% chance that it can go backwards. Never mind improve. It seems quite ridiculous that these changes are all positive. And they're all positive one after the other. These mutations will have to take place also in their reproductive cells. And then this creature, this perfect creature, that's all these chance mutations have taken place, this lucky son of a gun creature, would have to meet another female version that's also had these exact mutations in order to produce young that would have the same feature, same characteristic, or increase the probability of that. And yes, I've already mentioned, oh, all have to take place at the same time. And why is it progressive? What is driving this creature to aim at something when there's nothing behind it becoming that? Okay. And should there be any sea animals left now? Because if it is progressive for a creature to make its way out of the water, why did that creature go out of the water anyway? So the argument will be that there was no food in the water and there were creatures dying out in the water and the food was available out on the land. So when this creature went out on the land, it got food and the creatures in the water didn't get food and they died out. Well, there should be no sea animals left now. Why do we have the sea with so many animals, replete with various types of animals? And why not stay at going in and out of water? Isn't that better? A creature that can do both? Why leave the water and leave it for good? You know, it's all doesn't. And some have stopped evolving. Some are still at the same stage where they're happily in the water as a creature of the water. Why did they stop? What caused them to stop? Why didn't they progress continuously like the way we've seen some creatures supposedly eventually becoming humans? And we see no evidence at all that a mutation is passed on to offspring. Okay, a positive remember this has not been observable none of this is observable or has been observed or has been repeated in the laboratory like we saw with the fruit flies that was more the general point now the more specific point and here we're going to talk about the eye and we're going to try to understand how the eye was developed and how it has uh, has co you know caused the scene in terms of trying to suggest that the eye has just come about by chance First of all, where the eye is positioned, the eye is positioned perfectly, okay? It takes up a very small space, it's there, protected by the eyebrow, it's protected by the cheekbone, and uh, it's in the skull, which is the hardest part of the body, and it also has the uh, a cushion of fat just behind it, and it's linked to the brain directly uh, with uh, uh, sort of bony extensions, and and that's joined also to the, uh, the sorry, it's joined to the skull by these bony extensions, and these are protected. It's placed there to protect it from external harm, and it's in the area most appropriate for visions. Why aren't we finding uh, creatures 
uh, that, you know, there might be one or two creatures, for example, that might have eyes elsewhere because the eyes suit it where it is. But why is it that when we have creatures that are biped or at least quadruped, that the eyes are all on the head? Surely there would have been some creature that would have our eyes somewhere else. And why wouldn't that have survived? It's the only, you know, we don't see any intermediate creature that, you know, started with eyes on its bottom or started with eyes on its knees or started with eyes on its chest. And then we see the eye moving around until eventually, randomly, by chance, it finds itself on the head and then it stopped doing it as though it's like as if though it f it's found its spot. It's like you're playing marbles and, the you know, you know, when you're sort of, you know, you've got those little marbles inside that we used to have these little games where there were holes. You know, you have this plastic game inside your hand and it would have uh, it would be sealed and it'd have little marbles inside it. And you'd move it around until the marble fell in the hole. It is as though the, the eye hole was waiting for it to be there. Then the question arrives is, did the eyebrow come about first before the eye? Or did the cheekbone come about? Was there the eyebrow and no cheekbone? Or, or was there the cushion of fat and then the eyebrow? Then So, which, you know, all these all these things would have had to happen at the same time in order for the eye to be protected. Again, this is going beyond maths. We're not even going, you know, if we were, I think we're going even past the realms of probability. Then we have the eyelids themselves, the protection and the moisture retention that we are there and the oily lubricant. And I'm really now picking up pace to get through this because I'm conscious of time and I don't really want it to be too heavy upon you. And I apologize if it already has. I would suggest maybe just going back and, and playing certain parts again. It acts as an early warning system. We naturally close our eyes when somebody sort of moves their arm towards us. Uh, that How did that come about? Tears, they're the perfect eye lotion. 98.2% water has got urea, glucose, salts, organic substances, which include an enzyme, lysozyme, and, this is, uh, and the eye teardrop is coated in a thin, fatty film. We have eyebrows and eyelashes, which protect us from sweat, sunlight, particles getting there. Again, if you had... Uh, an eye with no eyelid, then the eye would be of no use to anybody. And for people to say, oh, no, that would have been all right. Well, the eye would have dried out within days. How long is it going to take for this creature then to then obviously reproduce and then that reproduce to, to, to bear young? You know, we, the, the, things don't just happen like in seconds. We couldn't do it with a fruit fly that bears young at ridiculous speeds. Then how is that going to happen with a creature maybe which mates once a year or something? Eye too, obviously, because there's two eyes. Sorry, I couldn't help that. Muscles. The muscles around the eye, I think there's about six muscles around the eye, and they have over 100,000 movements a day. Over 100,000 movements a day. That's over a billion in a lifetime. You know, really, by chance, the muscles would have had to come at the same time, and I can go on and on. Conjunctive membrane, which is on the eyeball surface, which stops, doesn't stop friction, because we're seeing some friction here. It stops friction. I've missed the eye from there. Cornea, which receives the light, and I'll carry on pressure in the eye, lightness to darkness, retina, the vision, the color, the visual field, etc., etc., etc. I got too excited there. So you can see here that really, are we saying that all these things happened all at the same time for this eye? Because they would have to happen at the same time, because any one of these partial would be of no use whatsoever. Some people say, yes, uh, uh, if you had an eye which could determine darkness from light, then that would be better. Beneficial. Yes, but the problem is, is that how would that then change into another type of eye? How would it know to progress on this? That, yep, I think we've got that part right. Let me give you an example. If I had, and this is being really kind, if I had 10 dice in my hand and I shook them and I wanted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten to appear on that dice, okay? So I shake these dice and I throw it on the floor and I get one and I get three fours and blah, 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 but I've got the one. So I think, yes, I've got the one. Now, I have to pick that one back up again and shake it again. When I throw it, now I've got two threes, uh, you know, fours, fives, sixes, sevens, eights, no ones. So I start again. So that eye, that creature that had this light uh, detecting eye will now go back to being uh, completely blank again because this is all random. Let's not forget the random nature of this as well. These are all random mutations. They're not being conducted or structured in a certain way. Oops, sorry, I'm now clicking, continuously going to click back. So these series of mutations, remember, it's got to be a mutation upon a mutation. Those that argue that, yes, the eye and all this other thing happened, a mutation after a mutation, suggesting that the creature lived, suggesting that that, could, that it breeded, suggesting that it took place within the... Um, 
cells, the reproductive cells, suggesting that they were then this mutation was handed over to the young, even though there is no science to support that, none whatsoever. How does it determine it is good when it is in a series? How? Because good can only be determined when you know what you're looking for. Like I just told you, when I throw these dice down and a one comes up, I was looking for one. I've now got one. Now I only need two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But the creature doesn't know that. The creature doesn't know. Oh, I've got nearly. I'm nearly there because I now have an eye which can determine light from dark. Brilliant. Okay, now I need to make it such such. It doesn't know. It can and it can always go backwards because it is just a figure. And that's the point that I make. Why not regressive? Why are all these progressive? And then that leads on to part two, which is evolution never hurt nobody. All it does is make things better. Hopefully you can see the extra pun in there. But for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will have to join me again, inshallah, for part two, in which we try to understand, but what if? And how, what are the implications if we were to accept evolution, even though now, from a scientific background, because the part one was very much from a scientific background, we should have proven quite categorically that this is not possible. So I hope you can join me again for part two. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, I can follow.